the ECI protocol from Elias. Uh, so outlining in general what those steps are, how many patient visits that we're talking about, uh, maybe potentially different locations that clients need to go to. Anyone wanna tackle that that's using the ECI currently? At our hospital, we have enrolled 14. Um, so kind of have gotten somewhat used to the protocol. Um, so basically what it entails is a screening uh, visit where they get chest x-rays, blood work, um, radiographs of the limb to make sure, you know, we have high suspicion for osteosarcoma. Um, and then they sign some paperwork going over, you know, they may be, um, at least for this clinical trial, the standard of care versus the ECI product. Um, the tumor is harvested uh, during surgery. Um, a small amount of the tissue is taken, placed in a special medium, and is shipped out to create a vaccine. Um, and then the patient has to come in a week later to start a set of three vaccines, um, which are administered under the skin. Um, and that's to help stimulate the body's immune response against that cancer, cancer antigen. Uh, and then two weeks later, they come in for apheresis to remove those um, T cells that have hopefully been stimulated against the cancer antigen. And that's then reinfused a week later, followed by several IL-2 injections to hopefully kind of promote those um, T cells in vivo. That's a, a brief summary. I don't know if that was the question or if we want to go through more step by step. No, I think that that was an excellent review. Can you I guess put some uh, further granularity as to um, what has gone well, what has particularly been problematic from a clinical perspective at each of those different steps. Um, other sure. kind of nitty gritty things is just the shipment of the, the vaccine. Um, initially, we didn't have a negative 85 degree freezer. Um, so we had to kind of coordinate the patient coming in at the time in which the, the vaccine would be shipped um, so that it wasn't sitting around for too long. Um, but otherwise, it's been relatively straightforward once we've been able to get some of those kinks figured out. Um, we're fortunate enough to be able to do apheresis on site. Um, so that has made a, a lot of the logistical stuff easier. Um, those are kind of the, the biggest things that we've run into. How about other roundtable members, Dr. Fleming? So... Um, I'm an oncology only practice, which led to a bit more logistics to work out when we started up with the Elias trial. Um, it was very successful once we worked out the kinks, but um, being able to do our staging and then have surgery scheduled at an appropriate time at our associated surgical group was a bit of a challenge, given the window of time that the trial allows um, with now going into commercial standard patient selection, that won't be as much of a concern, but that was a bit of a challenge as well as having our surgeons trained. And then we also have, do not have apheresis on site. So one of the things that is challenging and will continue from a patient care standpoint will be coordinating three different centers in a very short period of time. Thankfully, um, because apheresis centers are obviously not <laughs> all over the place. When you do need them, they're so receptive to be able to help. And clients who are in for this were kind of in it for the long haul. So that went very well from a client perspective. The vaccine visits were very, very simple and easy. Um, we do have minus 85, so that made that aspect really um, quite simple. Um, oncology um, center that has apheresis within a reasonable distance. Ours is about an hour south of us. So clients would just plan a day trip to go and have their pet have their apheresis done. It could be very um, easily set up, I think, and um, without a lot of client um, difficulty. Dr. Wright, can you talk a little bit about sort of a site that had no apheresis and sort of some of the, the scariness, I guess, aspect to that and, and now how you approach that? Yeah, um, I mean, first of all, it took me six weeks to spell it correctly. But when, once we got that machine on board, it was a joke. 
um, <clears throat> it, it's the, the, the learning curve for a machine like this, I, you know, it's not part of any standard residency training. It's not part of most technical or veterinary technician schools. So we, we had a lot of people had to learn a lot of stuff, to be honest. Um, I, I, Elias was a great partner um, in, in helping us get that training and, and, and speeding up the learning curve. Um, we, uh, we, we have a machine on site. So kind of like others had said, th those first couple, just getting the logistical details of apheresis um, in your hospital, the, the physical plant footprint that you need, the amount of technical staff that you need dedicated for, a, for what is proving to be at least half of a day. Um, all of those have, have to be worked out. Um, our facility has chosen to do a sedation model versus general anesthesia. That seems to have worked out for us. Um, it, it does improve kind of cost to client um, issues uh, and it well, as well as we think it frees up more staff for us um, to, to focus on, on, the, on the patient and the machine. Um, so it's, it, it shouldn't be taken lightly. I mean, I think practices that are considering bringing an aphoresis unit into their, into their practice need to really look at, it, at all the details. Um, again, physical, physical space expectation, time commitments, cost uh, markups to clients, all of those things really need to be weighed before you sign up for this. And then you need to ask yourself, I think, um, which may be on the sc scope of this, um, uh, this conversation is, what else is that machine gonna be able to do for you in your practice? Is there therapeutic plasma exchange and, and things, um, toxicity managements that you could also rely on to, to justify the use of that equipment? So, um, but, but it all, we, we've worked through it all and, and, I, and I'm proud of our team and it seems to be a, um, we've made it through the other side and it's a readily part of our practice now. Dr. Jeglum, can you speak to sort of your experience uh, on the T-cell infusion side? Yeah, we had uh, somebody coming in, an independent company to do our apheresis. So that was quite convenient. And we do have a surgeon in-house and also everything was essentially done under the one roof. Now going forward, that particular company is not going to be traveling and doing apheresis for this product. So we will be looking at having to go to another center for the apheresis phase of this. I don't think personally, again, somebody brought it up. These clients are so committed that an hour or two hour tra travel is not going to be, you know, prohibiting them from going forward. So I don't think that is a major problem. I think a bigger question that I think will come out later is the practicality of this within specialty practices, oncology centers versus quote, general practices that don't have the specialists under roof in the specific areas. And we're not addressing that now I realize, but for us, we're a center as most of everybody is in this conversation, it, it's very workable. But I think when we get down to nitty gritty, there'll be other issues of practicality that we haven't addressed as of yet. So for us, we had no significant limitations.